the call to worship this morning. And the first line will be for me. And then I would like for you to chime in, yell out, lift your hands, enjoy the second line. And then at the very end, we'll read Romans 5, 1 through 5 together. Give thanks to the Lord, for He is good. He is faithful, God endures forever. Let God's people say, His faithful love endures forever. Let the people of Redeemer Bible Church say, His faithful love endures forever. And that, let those who fear the Lord say, His faithful love endures forever. And let's read this together. Therefore, since we have been declared righteous by faith, we have, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. We have also obtained access through him by faith into this grace in which we stand. And we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. And not only that, but we also rejoice in our afflictions. Because we know that affliction produces endurance. And endurance produces proven character. And proven character produces hope. This hope will not disappoint us. Because God's love has been poured out in our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. So let's worship this morning and enjoy. Morning. 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 Uh, we hope that you'll stay this morning for our Lord's Supper, which is following. But we are not allowed to have any food in here, so we go outside under the trees and do the Lord's Supper there. Uh, one of our elders, Chris, will be leading us this morning. I hope you can stay, and if it's inclement out there, raining cats and dogs, I guess we could do it maybe here in the foyer, but we'll just kind of watch as we go. Um, also, I wanted to thank Roddy. Is Roddy with us this morning? No. Roddy uh, filled the pulpit, brought the word last the last two weeks, and I wanted to publicly say thank you to Roddy. Roddy always does a good job. He's a student of the Word, and you can depend on him to give it straight and to give it relevant. So if you see him, uh, give him a thank. Give him a high five. Tell him thank you for his preparation. And we are a better church because he's a member. He and his wife, Diana, and kids are members. And at the cost of maybe having to reduce my message just a tad this morning, uh, uh, I'll begin with a verse that we're all familiar with. You've heard me say it many times, James 1.27. Uh, true religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is to take care of widows in their distress, widows and orphans in their distress. We do this, of course, with our Carl Manor Ministries uh, each week, and uh, we hope that you will consider joining either the women's team or the men's team. But I have another widow to bring before your attention this morning. Um, A year ago, Savannah's husband died of sepsis. She's 35. And she left, uh, or he left, obviously, her and a 10 year old girl. She uh, turns 10, I think, this week. Uh, I met her uh, four or five months ago, and every time I see her, she uh, has to fight back tears. And uh, she told me that her car. Uh, was unsafe to drive. So I took a look at it. I said, uh, professionals need to look at this thing. Um, so I sent it to the shop where I have some professional mechanics. And they looked at it for three days. And they said, this car is junk. It's unsafe. Don't ever buy anything from Europe. Sorry about that, anybody? <laughs> and I would concur. I would concur. Unless you have millions of dollars, don't buy a European car, ever. So, and I'm not being paid to make that advertisement. But I think U.S. and Canadian auto manufacturing is years ahead for everything in terms of the automotive industry. So, uh, the mechanic said to me, this car, she needs to get rid of it. It's not safe. So, um, my plea this morning is, if you know of a car, that is for sale, and that's reliable for a young mother with a 10-year-old daughter. Her name is Lily. I have a picture, but I just can't show it to you this morning. If you have a car for sale, if you know one who has a car for sale, let me know. And we're going to do what we can 
uh, perhaps as a church to help her. All she does is wait tables. And you know, most of you, you're not a millionaire if you wait tables. That's a hard job. You're on your feet all day long. And this morning, she's at work. So if you want to do something about this, please help. She's a widow. She's all by herself. Her in-laws, who have kind of pushed her away since the death of her husband. And I said, Savannah, I'll trust the Lord that our people will come alongside you, and God will supply her needs. And I'm hoping that she's going to be overwhelmed by how God's people have loved her, even though she's a stranger. What does the verse say? Religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this. To take care of what? Widows and orphans in their what? Distress. She's in distress. She's in distress. Would you like to drive a car without air conditioning? That's her. So, if you know a car, or if you want to donate some money for it, or something, uh, you know, I give her a car, but I don't have one to get. So think about it, pray about it, and let's watch God do his work. Any questions? Any questions about that? If we have something that we just text you. We yeah. Can. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. We can talk to you or Michelle just if we Sure. Yeah. Anybody have any questions about it? I know you're a young congregation. You don't have a whole lot of cars, so that makes sense. You may know somebody. It may. needs to be bought outright, right? No car payment. She. Well, she, she told me she wants to go on Facebook to the marketplace and you know buy a car that way, and that's a red that's a red flag. The automotive industry is built on deceit and fraud. Trust me, I've been in it many many years, and. Uh, She's a single girl. You can just imagine a seller seeing a young girl coming up to him looking for a car in desperate need. I mean, that's an accident waiting to happen. So let me know if you have a car for sale or know of a car for sale or want to donate yours or whatever. Okay? God, you sent the rain earlier this morning as a reminder of your goodness towards a lost and dying and broken and miserable world. The rain falls on the just and the unjust, and that it was followed by sunshine. God causes the sun to rise both on the evil and on <coughs> the good. We worship you for that. We heard lightning this morning. I really felt tempted to talk about what the scripture means to be able to see lightning and hear lightning. But I'm going to pass on that and focus on the text this morning. But help us this morning. Help us to uh, hear the voice of the Lord speaking. The most important event in our life is to hear the voice of the Lord every Sunday as we gather together. Speak to a heart that's empty, discouraged, on the wrong track. Speak to a heart that's not a, a, a heart of faith. Give them faith this morning to trust in our wonderful Savior. Be an encouragement to all of those who are discouraged. Strengthen all of the academic population here teachers, etc., as Amanda has prayed. And my special prayer is for anybody here who is in the shoes of Esau and needs redemption, needs a U-turn. Provide the grace necessary to make that U-turn this morning. Do it here, do it around the world, wherever the gospel is proclaimed. In the simplest, simplest storefront, in the middle of the jungle, by a riverbank, in a cathedral, somewhere in a secret place in North Korea or in a Muslim country. Do it, Lord. Bring glory to yourself. Destroy the enemy. Smash down his gates and let your kingdom come. For Jesus' sake, I pray. And everybody said right off. Amen. One of my uncles who is in glory today uh, is one of my favorite uncles. He's a Canadian. He flew for the Royal Canadian Air Force in the Second World War in a bomber. Uh, he was the tail gunner, a gunnery sergeant. And he flew bombing missions every night over Germany uh, under the command of the British and Canadian Air Forces. By day, the Americans bombed Germany in their B-17s and B-24s. And I wonder how many of you just recently watched a television series called Masters of the Air. How many saw that? Raise your hand. Two people. <laughs> you need to be educated, folks. Come on. <laughs> 
Masters of the Air is a, an American-made television series about a group of uh, American pilots who flew over Germany by day, bombing Germany. Well, about um, 10 or 15 years ago, I bought a book called Masters of the Air, because uh, since I was in grade seven, due to my uncle, Uncle Sid, who flew in a bomber, uh, I've read everything ever written on the bombing campaign over Germany, World War II. This is written by Donald Hamilton, and I bought it 10, 15 years ago, and the series was supposedly based on this book. It's not. Uh, there's, they have nothing in common. The series is more based on this book, which I read many years ago as well, called The Luck of the Draw by Frank Murphy, a good Irishman, uh, a good American Irishman, and he was part of that television series who was shot down and was a prisoner of war for a year in a German, <coughs> uh, uh, a German prisoner of war camp. So if you want to read something about the series, you can read Frank Murphy's Luck of the Draw. Well, Donald Hamilton, in his book, addresses the problem that has been talked about since the end of the war. Why would British, Canadian, and Americans bomb civilians? Instead of going after military and industrial targets to try to destroy the German war machine, why did they bomb cities like Dresden and kill thousands of innocent civilians, Germans and men. Why? Donald Hamilton responds to the questions, to the accusations. It's the best book, best book I've ever read on the topic. If you ever are looking for one. This is what he says. The inexcusable, out of control bombing of early 1945 by the Americans and the Canadians and the British stands as a warning to nations that launch wars of aggression. When the people who are targets of their malice are forced to fight for their very survival, they will, if they are strong enough, fight with unhinged fury with the aim of completely crushing the enemy. In other words, the German people in those bomb cities were not victims. They had to pay the bill, yes, but it was millions of those same ordinary German citizens who made a choice in the 1930s to support Adolf Hitler and his wars of aggression. And when he began to be seen as anti-Semitic, putting Jews in concentration camps and supporting him and supporting those policies, they did not know it, but they were making their own bed of destruction. One day, after sowing the wind, they would reap the whirlwind. They set themselves up to have their own schools, their own homes destroyed. They are not victims. The Genesis author, one who wrote Genesis, Moses, tells us the very, very sad story of Esau and his dad. And he shows us that they're not, they're not victims. They reap what they sow, and we are not to feel sorry for them. They are not victims. They got what was coming to them. Now, most people would rather not read these verses. It's not the power of positive thinking. This is not going to be your best day to use the words of a false teacher from Houston, Texas. <clears throat> These stories of Esau and his father Isaac in Genesis 27, verses 30 to 40, are placed in the Bible on purpose. And we're going to look at them this morning. I'm going to unpack the text. And we'd like to see what it is that God has to say to us. So if you're not there, I invite you to join me, either on your phone or a hard copy. I'm looking at one story in two paragraphs. If you're going to follow me, here's what I'm doing. We're going to look at verses 30 through 34 of Genesis 27. And then part of the same narrative is same chapter, Genesis 27, 
verses 35 through uh, 40. That's where I'm headed. Two paragraphs. And the emphasis in both of these paragraphs, which are placed together side by side, bumper to bumper, the emphasis, what's repeated, what's underlined, what's underscored is this. Both men, the dad and the son, Esau and Isaac, all they have left to do because of the choices they make, all they can do is scream and cry and weep in grief. And we are not to feel sorry. They got what was coming. And the Bible places these stories in here as red flags to all of us to say, we reap what we sow. Sounds pretty direct this morning, doesn't it? That's because the Bible is direct. It's not a Bible full of fairy tales. This is real life. And if I've met people over the years who've tried to play fast and loose with their lives and then put off living for God at the end of the age, you know what? It's disaster on every occurrence. Let's read the text. Verse 30. Isaac had just finished blessing Jacob. You hear that emphasis? Just finished. And Jacob had scarcely left the presence of Isaac, his father, when his brother Esau came in from the hunt. You see the timing there? That's on purpose. The timing is important in the book of Genesis. If you remember, when the servant of Abraham was told to go and find a wife for Isaac, he prayed, Lord, show me a sign. As I'm heading into this territory, show me a sign that you have led the right woman to be the wife of Isaac. And just as he got done praying, what happened? He saw a woman coming with a jug of water on her shoulder at that very moment. And it was God's way of saying, timing-wise, this is the woman for Isaac. Verse 31, he also prepared some tasty food and brought it to his father. And he said to his father, my father, arise and eat some of your son's wild game. Then your soul can bless me. Verse 32. His father Isaac asked him, Who are you? Remember, Isaac is blind. He can't see. And he has just, without knowing it, blessed Jacob through fraud and deceit on the part of Jacob. And verse 33. Isaac trembled. He trembled with a great trembling. He trembled violently. He's panicking. And asked, who then is he who hunted game and brought it to me so that I ate from all before you arrived and blessed him? He will indeed be blessed. In other words, there's nothing I can do about it. That blessing, once it's given, it's gone. We can't bring it back. It's a dumb deal. Now notice, here's how the paragraph ends. Here's what the writer, Moses, wants us to get from this interaction. When Esau, that's the eldest son, the hunter who despised his birthright, when Esau heard his father's words, he yelled, he screamed, a loud and bitter yell to excess. Wow. What's the writer doing here? Why is Moses including this story? Why didn't he leave it out? Why include a story of pain and bitterness? He is showing us that if we are like Esau, had a good mom and dad, Isaac, or excuse, yeah, uh, Isaac and Rebecca, we'll talk more about that. Good mom and dad. He had a birthright. But he looked at it and said, this isn't worth anything when Jacob asked to buy it. And so he sold it. 
to Jacob for a bowl of beans. The most valuable thing in his life, he traded away. Because we trade away things and give away things that aren't valuable to us. It wasn't valuable to him. God was not valuable to him. It was not a priority of his life. It was not the modus operandi of his life. Now, the writer shows us what happened as a result of that choice. And what's the result? It's anguish and bitterness and grief and sadness and there's nothing that can be done. It's irreversible. That's what he wants to show us. That if we sow to our flesh, if we sow to the world, if we give our best to ourselves, a life of self-gratification, this is what we can expect. God didn't intervene. God arranged it so that as soon as Jacob left his father's presence, he saw Canaan too late. Too late. So he is showing us pain and suffering and agony. Time is an issue here. Esau came in too late. Time is an issue in the Bible. The scripture says in Isaiah 55, Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is what? Near. Because he does not always be found. And he is not always near. When you have the opportunity when you're young, do it. Don't waste the opportunity. Because you're banking on late repentance. You're counting on, well, when I get old and gray, then I'll live for God. Brothers and sisters, faith and repentance are gifts that God gives. And if you have not taken advantage of them all your life, and then you expect God to come to your beck and call, think again. God will withhold those things because they're gifts. And you've rejected them for such a long, long time. That's what happened to Esau. He had a chance to change. He never did. He's a pagan. Even though he had a good dad and mom. Book of Hebrews chapter 12, which we will read later indicates that he sought repentance with tears. And he's referring to this passage. So we have a dad and a son who lived for self-gratification. Isaac lived for what he put in his mouth. And Esau loved what the world had to offer. And now he pays the price. It's a sober, solemn warning for all is that we live in a just world, ruled by a just God, and we are not in charge of our lives. We are not even in charge of our schedule. God rules. The next paragraph is part of the story. You've got to read it. Read it with me. We've seen father and son <coughs> respond with panic, bitterness, and screaming. Because that's all I was left to do. Esau said to his father, I'm at 34b, he said to his father, bless me, me too, my father. He really emphasized his father, mentions it twice. But Isaac replied, that's the dad, your brother came in here fraudulently, deceitfully, and received your blessing. Esau exclaimed, is he not rightly named Jacob? Meaning, Jacob meaning grabbing someone from behind by the heel. He has tripped me up two times. Let me stop there. He is lying. He writes, or he says, he took away my birthright. No, he didn't. <laughs> Jacob did not take away his birthright. What happened? He sold it to sold it. Yes, he saw sold it. For a bowl of beans. But in our anger and in our bitterness, what do we do about the past? We blame somebody else and we consider ourselves what? Victims. Poor me. But Isaac is not a victim and neither is Esau. Neither of them are victims. They're both suffering the consequences of their choices. Look, he has taken away my blessing. He has. 
Have you not kept back a blessing for me? And Isaac replied, Look, I have made him Lord over you. Wow. It's irreversible. <coughs> I've made all his relatives his servants and provided him with grain and new wine. What is left that I can do for you? The author is giving us this conversation between dad and son and a great deal of bitterness and crying and weeping. And, and the words of Isaac is saying, it's a done deal. You can't get it back. You can't pull it back. There's nothing you can do. It's out of your hands. It's totally in the hands of God. And Esau said, you only have one blessing? See what's changed? Esau has changed about his attitude towards the blessing, but it's what? It's too late. Yeah. It's too late. Bless me also, my father. And then, notice, Esau lifted up his voice and wailed. Can't you just hear it? So his father said, look, feeling pity for him. Your home will be by the fatness of the land and the dew of the sky above. You will live by your sword. In other words, you used to hunt animals. Now you're going to hunt people. But you will serve your brother. And when you grow restless, you can break off the yoke from his neck. Four things come to my mind by way of takeaway. I appreciate your patience as we go over these takeaways that I have drawn from this particular story. First, the story, as I see it, is a reality check that's good for all of us to read. What do I mean by that? Well, what show have you ever watched on television, book read, movie watched, concert gone to, anything discussed in social media? Which one tells us the truth about eternity and the judgment of God? Which one? Which one is real? Which one is not fairy tale? Which story shows that when people make bad choices, they suffer consequences permanently? Which one? What I see in our culture is basically one fairy tale after the next, after the next, after the next. This story is not a fairy tale. This story is what? It's a reality check. It's like, oh, okay, this is what really happens. <laughs> this is reality. This is what we need to keep in mind when we think about our choices made while we're young. So here's some reality checks. The first one is our dreams for our future family. For example, everyone here who's young, you're in your 20s, you're in your 30s, maybe you're cracking 40, you got young kids, and you have a future dream. And here's what that dream's like. It's prosperous, it's happy, and you're gonna just live happily ever after, and have a nice uh, retirement. Let me ask you, did Isaac have dreams of a future prosperous, happy life? Did he? He did. And what happened? They were shattered. Because he had made his mouth. What he put in his mouth as the modus operandi of his life. That's what governed his life, is what he put into his mouth. That was his choice and his dream shattered. He started out well. So did Rebecca. Got married at 40. He prayed for 20 years for his wife to have a baby. He stuck with her. She had two babies, twins. They both started out wonderfully. But he came to a fork. Are you at a fork? He came to a fork in the road, and over here it says, life is a party. And the other one, a life of faith in God, said, life's a pilgrimage. I'm traveling home to my Father in heaven, and I want to make a difference in everyone who's traveling home to my Father in heaven. No, he chose life's a party. Life's all about good times. That's what the prophet's son thought, right? He left home, life's a party. He wanted to live high on the hog. He ended up living with the hogs. The older brother at home was all about rules. He thought life was a prison. 
Life's not a prison. Life's not a party. Life's a pilgrimage. I'm traveling home to my father in heaven. And I want to make a difference in every single man, woman, boy, or girl who's traveling on this same path. But Isaac said, no, life's all about getting high. Life's all about making money. Life's all about putting things in my mouth, tasting good. And he took that fork in the road. And that fork created this event right here. It came down in a heap. The dreams came down in a heap. So I would urge you, you're young. You've got years ahead of you. Which is it going to be? Life's a party, a prison, or a pilgrimage. Choose. Because it'll make a difference when it comes down to saying goodbye to your children. Reality check for marriage. First is reality check for dreams for our future. What, what do you want that dream to look like? Third, or second, marriages. Marriages cannot survive on autopilot or cruise control. This marriage started out really, really well. When Rebecca had twins and they were, the twins were fighting each other, smashing each other, she did a great thing. She inquired of the Lord and said, Lord, what's going on? And he said, well, the older son is going to serve the younger. He's going to serve the chicken. She believed it. She believed it. What a great woman of faith. A great woman of faith. But when her husband started to stray, she resorted to deception and jealousy and manipulation to get her way. So she took a fork on the road, too. She was trying to do the right thing. Good motives. Bad methods. They're not talking when they should be talking. They're so busy, they can't talk together at important times. Is your marriage on cruise control? Um, there's usually some sort of a match that is struck that creates a bonfire. And for Isaac, it was when he started moving in the direction of what he put in his mouth. Is there, is there a match that's been struck in a marriage here? Get help. Ask for help. We would love to help people who are both teachable, who both say, you know, I'm responsible for this problem. Um, we need help to get over it. Let's, let's move together in the direction that keeps us talking together, communicating to each other. We're not too busy. Make God our priority and listening to the voice of the Lord as our priority. God can help you. Even if your marriage started out bumpy, it can get better and better and better. Provided you pursue voice of the Lord as the map of your life. This is where Isaac strayed. Started well, went down here fast. He had a leak, a slow leak. And eventually that tire of marriage went flat. I hope it doesn't happen to anybody here. Take care of your marriage. Make it a priority. Make listening to the voice of God your most important priority of life. And you will never regret it. Ever. Third, the reality check of procrastination. Anybody here struggle with procrastination? Anybody? Maybe one? Yeah. What is that? Um, <laughs> it's the manana man. I'll do it tomorrow. Right? I'll put it off till tomorrow. I'll take Jesus seriously when I got gray hair. <coughs> Today is the day to take Jesus Christ seriously and to dump the American dream or the Canadian dream. What you are today is what you're going to be when you're older, in all probability. Esau was ruined because he didn't come in time. There is an accepted time to pursue and follow Christ with all our heart. And the best time to do it is when, when you're young, starting out fresh, and willing to change. Because the older you get, the harder it is to change. Youth is the seed time of old age. And what you will be at the age of 70 is what you are at the age of 30. 
For example, and all of creation supports this. All of creation supports what I'm saying. Here's some examples. How do we predict what the fruit will be like on that tree? Check out the blossom. Bad blossom, the young part of the apple, the young time of the apple, bad blossom, bad apple. Here's the illustration. I visited my father and mother when they were on furlough. They were renting a house that belonged to um, the McGuire's up in Ontario. There was a crab apple tree. Now, I love going back to Ontario because there's Macintosh apples everywhere. And they are so good. When you bite them, they crack. You have ever heard the crack of a Macintosh apple that hasn't been in a storehouse for six months, a real freshman? Well, you can go to these orchards and pick them yourself for a, for a minimal price. Well, there was a crab apple tree. You know what a crab apple tree is? It's not an apple that's crabby. It's just the name. So I wanted to find an apple I could eat because I was living in Florida, and there's not a whole lot of apple trees in our yard. So. Um, I went up to the crab apple tree, and every single apple tree, or every single apple, was full of worms. I thought, that's weird. I mean, I went everywhere looking for a decent apple to eat. They were all wormy. Like, what happened? Well, I did some asking of the farmers in the area, and they said it's very simple. The reason that every apple has a worm in it is because the worms lay their eggs in the blossom. And so as the apple grows, the worms eat everything inside the apple. And that's why every single apple had a worm in it. See, the seed time of the apple is determining of what the apple will be like in the older age. How do you predict what the day is going to be like? By the morning, right? by what the weather is like in the morning. How do you judge what the harvest is going to be in the fall? By the quality of the spring planting. You see, the time to prepare for a good harvest is in the spring, when you're plowing the soil and planting the seed. Youth is the time to make sure that we have a good harvest, that we have a good older age. Uh, I like history. Have you ever heard of a guy named Hannibal? Anybody ever heard of Hannibal? He didn't go to Keswick, trust me. He uh, was uh, a Carthaginian general who lived in North Africa who took on Rome. Nice. But he had an advantage. He had elephants. He had elephants part of his army. Can you imagine that? And when he, um, he went through Spain, came up through the Swiss Alps, and came into Italy from the north and destroyed the Roman armies when no one else had. And then he came close to the gates of Rome and he could have taken it, but he decided, no, I'm going to put it off. So he put off taking the greatest city on earth. He procrastinated. And then when he wanted to, he couldn't. And Rome defeated him. The time to seek the Lord is today, while you're young. And he saw discovered that too late. One man who I've read for many years says this, if you do not seek the Lord while you are young, the strength of habit is that you will never seek him. Habits are like roots. Every day that goes by, that root is thicker and longer and deeper and harder. Every day that you put off living for Christ, the gap between you and Jesus grows and grows and grows. And the wall between you and God grows higher and thicker every single day. A week from today, you either will be further away from Jesus or closer. And third, fourth, a reality check regarding grace. Now, the first three have been sober. I get it. This is a sober passage. There's no clowns and jokes in this passage, right? I get that. But let me end with hope. Yeah, how do you find hope in a passage like this? <laughs> well, there is. Because we're studying this series on Isaac and Rebecca and their marriage, you step back from the series, and I see hope. Why? 
this family is messy. Isaac, what a mess. Rebecca, what a mess. Jacob, ah, what a mess. Esau, dirtbag. Mess, 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 mess. But God used this messy family to accomplish his will. And he overruled by his sovereign grace and mercy all of the foibles and the mistakes and the sins and the cheating and the jealousy and the deception. He overruled it all to accomplish his redemptive program. So he puts their sins to use and he uses them to promote his kingdom. And the right man, Jacob, because God had said it was supposed to be that way. And he used mistakes. God can use our mistakes and our messiness and our mistakes to overrule and to arrange and to set up his great kingdom. That gives me hope. Doesn't that give you hope? Um, I'm going to be a little bit theological here. Forgive me. In Reformed Calvinistic circles, there's a phrase that's used. Maybe this is new to you. One of them is, it's called irresistible grace. How many have ever heard of irresistible grace? That's the view that God's grace cannot be resisted by people. If God wants something to happen, it's going to happen. But I'm bummed to with that word because I find a lot of people resist grace. Anybody know anybody here who resists grace? Well, I prefer a better word. I call it invincible grace. What does that mean? can't be beaten. God's grace always is victorious. Amen? Amen? So invincible grace is what I hold on to, what I'd like you to hold on to here. For your family, for your own personal life, your marriage, for your church, for your life. God's grace is going to win. But he's going to use our failures and our stupidity. He uses Esau. He uses Isaac. He uses Jacob. He uses Esau. It's a reality check regarding the grace of God. And that's why we can have hope. That's why we can have hope. Let me finish with the sky above again that I began with. Robert Rosenthal was a lawyer at the end of World War II. He married a lawyer. And he heard that uh, the U.S. was looking for judges to prosecute German war criminals. He thought, I'd like to do that. He was of Jewish faith. He thought, this is something I can do for my Jewish people. So he and his wife flew to Germany. And they acted as prosecutors in the Nuremberg trials. How many have ever heard of the Nuremberg trials? It's been made a motion picture two or three times. So they bring in these uh, German officers and people who are responsible for crimes against humanity. And he wrote a book. And uh, he talks about when he was living in Nuremberg, where the huge Nazi rallies used to be, millions of people just supporting Hitler and the Nazi party. And he saw people, after the war, bombed out cities, bombed out Nuremberg. And he saw people following them as he and his wife would walk <coughs> the streets in the evening. And the, he, would, he, was a, he was a smoker. And he would finish a cigarette. And I guess he would throw his butt not his anatomy, but the cigarette butt. He would, he, would throw, he would throw cigarette butts, let me get that clear, on the ground. He just did that. And he noticed that people, the German people, would run and pick up the butts. But there was nothing left to smoke. And he realized they were selling butts on the German black market simply to earn money to buy food. And he said, you had to feel sorry for them. I mean, I understand that. You don't have any money, you don't have any food, you have children. He said, but I refuse to believe that the German people were not responsible for Hitler, especially here in Nuremberg, the city where the Nazis held their Roman-like rallies and where adoring women threw flowers on Hitler's motorcade. See, it was these German citizens who had made choices <coughs> to support Hitler's sinister goals. They made their choices consequences that came later on were irreversible. And by making those choices, they put their children, their homes, and their lives at terrible risk. And there was nothing they could do to stop it. 
Some years ago, I read a book by a German. The end of the war. And he concluded, he said, the majority of my fellow Germans today, we know, though we won't say it, but we know that we provoked the annihilation of the very cities in which we once lived. Wow. In other words, the Germans were not victims. And neither was he slow, and neither was Isaac. They only have blamed themselves. Thank you for listening this morning. Pray as we stand together before we are dismissed from the Lord's Supper. Thank you for the clarity of your word. It's no nonsense. It does not beat around the bush. It is not varnished and whitewashed. You show us people their warts, their mistakes, and their grief and their suffering when they make choices. We've read one this morning. future dreams, happy, prosperous families. So did Isaac. Let every family here that has that dream experience it in reality someday. Because today, they made a decision to follow Christ as Savior and Lord and to not put you off and procrastinate and to say, I'll live for God a better day. Let today be the day when they do it. Behold, now is the day of salvation today. Remind us of that each day of the week. Give us encouragement throughout the week that choosing Christ to follow him daily and to put him first is the right thing to do. Maybe it's inconvenient. Assure them that whether it's inconvenient or not, it will pay dividends. I know that you want to see happy families, united families, families, husbands and wives in unity, children walking in the faith, children claiming the faith, children carrying on the testimony of their father and mother. If there's someone on the fence, if there's someone with one foot in Esau's head and the other in the land of faith, Today, give them strength to pull that leg out of Esau's mouth and set it firmly on the pathway of faith. These are your people, Lord. We've heard your word. Now it's depending on your spirit to do the work. We build the altar, you set down the fire. And you get all the credit, you get all the glory, because you are the greatest thing in the universe Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. What a glorious God you are and your redemption program. Thank you for listening to us this morning. Through Christ we pray.